Welcome back to the Parasitology Lecture Series. The point of this lecture is to discuss entamoeba histolytica and the common amoebiasis. So let's proceed. When we talk about entamoeba histolytica, it is always prudent to talk about the other non-pathogenic intestinal amoebae. Please take note that Giardia lamblia is not amongst these non-pathogenic amoebae. Humans, and perhaps non-human primates, are the only natural hosts of Entamoeba histolytica. So if there are outbreaks or environmental contamination present, it can be usually traced to human settlements. Entamoeba histolytica is a protozoan found worldwide, and it is the primary cause of amoebiasis. The highest prevalence of amoebiasis are in developing countries where barriers between human feces and food and water supplies are inadequate. Most cases of amoebiasis are asymptomatic, but dysentery and invasive extra-intestinal disease can occur, as we will learn in this lecture. The life cycle of Entamoeba histolytica is quite straightforward. It follows your typical circular life cycle, which starts with the ingestion of the cyst form in a fecal-oral or oro-anal transmission. In rare cases, it can also be due to direct inoculation of the organism. We should also take note that fecal-oral transmission can also occur in the setting of anal sexual practices or direct rectal inoculation, usually through colonic irrigation devices. Why is the cystic form the infective stage rather than the trophozoite form? Cysts are viable in the environment for weeks to months and can be found in fecally contaminated soil, fertilizer, or water, or on contaminated hands of food handlers. Trophozoites, on the other hand, are rapidly destroyed once outside the body. If ingested, it would not survive the exposure to the gastric environment of the stomach. Upon ingestion of the cyst, excistation then occurs in the terminal ileum or the colon resulting in trophozoites, which is the invasive form. Trophozoites can penetrate and invade the colonic mucosal barrier, leading to tissue destruction, secretory bloody diarrhea, and colitis resembling inflammatory bowel disease. What's problematic with entamoeba histolytica is that its trophozoites can spread hematogenously via the portal circulation to the liver or even to more distant organs, such as the lungs or even the brain. Both trophozoites and cysts are passed out in usually diarrheic stools. Trophozoites again die in the environment, but the cysts would persist ready to infect another host. In discussing entamoeba histolytica, it is also important for us to familiarize ourselves with the common terminologies associated with the organism and the disease. Amoebic colitis refers to the most common manifestation of invasive amoebiasis, and it pertains to infection and invasion of the colon. Amoebic liver abscess refers to the most common manifestation of extra-intestinal invasive amoebiasis. Amoebic dysentery refers to the type of diarrhea produced by entamoeba histolytica, which is usually bloody diarrhea. Luminal amoebiasis is the type of amoebiasis wherein the entamoeba histolytica organism is not able to go inside and invade other tissues, thus remaining in the intestinal lumen and not being too problematic. As we said earlier, luminal amoebiasis is usually asymptomatic, while the invasive form of intestinal amoebiasis, which is called your intestinal colitis, manifests with dysentery. The parts of the intestines that it usually invades would be the colon, the appendix, or sometimes they form amoebomas. Invasive extra-intestinal amoebiasis usually manifests as liver abscesses, sometimes amoebic peritonitis, pleuropulmonary abscesses, and in even rarer cases, can actually extend to other organs such as the skin or even the genital region. The type of dysentery associated with entamoeba histolytica is called your mucosanguinous diarrhea. 
Mucous anguinous stools usually account for 90% of invasive intestinal manifestations. The pathophysiology of Entamoeba histolytica and its disease entity will be explained in the next few slides. We should take note first that amoebiasis as a disease may be caused by ingestion of only a small number of cysts. And the exact mechanism of how in N cysts and X cysts are actually poorly understood. The first barrier preventing mucosal injury is the intestinal mucus blanket. Trophozoites in axenic cultures are known to secrete a variety of molecules, some of which have been identified as proteases. Irritation by the organism stimulates goblet cells to release mucus, and this explains the glandular hyperplasia usually associated with entamoeba histolytica infections. Overproduction of mucin leads to mucoid dysentery seen in invasive amoebiasis. Eventually, when mucin gets depleted, the first line of defense is actually taken care of. And this leads to the ability of the trophozoites to adhere to the naked colonic epithelial cells. This adherence is mediated by the galactose N acetylgalactosamine specific lectin or your gal galnac specific lectin. Please take note of this throughout the lecture. It has been shown that mucosal immunoglobulin A response against this specific lectin results in fewer recurrent infections. So therefore, IgA is very important in resisting amoebiasis attacks. But the counter-argument of entamoeba histolytica against mucosal IgA and the membrane attack complex is its possession of a CD5 slash protectin-like molecule which protects it from the membrane attack complex. If you recall immunology, CD5 glycoprotein is also known as the membrane attack complex inhibitory protein, the membrane inhibitor of reactive lysis or your protectin, is a protein that humans usually secrete to protect itself from other membrane attack complexes. But in this case, Entamoeba histolytica uses a similar molecule to protect itself against human membrane attack complexes. Both lytic and apoptotic pathways have also been described, and these are usually facilitated by another factor called your amoeba pores. Amoeba pores are responsible for forming pores in eukaryotic lipid bilayers. Please take note of amoeba pores as well. This picture here shows a more advanced stage of invasion where in numerous trophozoites can be seen penetrating the col colonic ulcer. This is your colonic ulcer. Entamoeba histolytica cysteine proteases, or EHCPs, are very, very important in the pathophysiology of the disease. It plays a role in the invasion and immune system alteration occurring during amoebiasis. During invasion, the extracellular matrix is destroyed, the colonic epithelium detaches, and ulcers are generated. The EHCPs, together with other proteases such as metalloproteases and hemoglobinase, which is a specific protease designed to ingest red blood cells, these are the ones responsible for eating through the intestinal mucosa. Metalloproteases degrade collagen type 1 and type 3 of the extracellular matrix. Cysteine proteases are also responsible for inactivating C3A and C5A and also cleaves mucosal IgA and immunoglobulin G or IgG. These immune system altering capabilities enable entamoeba histolytica to be successful in its pathogenesis. Here is a picture showing your trophozoid here. I will highlight the trophozoid there. And it's protruding pseudopodium. So it moves via a pseudopodium or a false feet, and locomotion is actually part of the invasion process. The pseudopodium anchors to fibronectins and the extracellular matrix substrates, and it pulls the parasite forward, and then extracellular matrix degradation occurs via the proteases, cysteine proteases, as well as metalloproteases and hemoglobinases. The next step in the pathogenesis is the inflammatory reaction. 
Upon invasion, inflammatory mediators are released by the body, including C5A, interleukin 1B, interleukin 8, cyclooxygenase 2, which increases neutrophil counts and increases the mobility of macrophages towards the site of infection. These inflammatory reactions, of course, increases tissue damage, which eventually leads to more entamoeba histolytica being able to penetrate through the damaged tissues. For some unknown reason, entamoeba histolytica is resistant to the oxidative burst associated with neutrophils and macrophages. And in fact, macrophages need high populations per amoeba from 200 macrophages to one amoeba or even 3,000 to one in order to kill just one entamoeba histolytica organism. And also, the cysteine proteases and the amoeba pores of entamoeba histolytica are also capable of killing the responding macrophages. So there is an, an actual fight going on from, let's say, a single entamoeba histolytica being attacked by multiple neutrophils and macrophages, and in the end, the entamoeba histolytica can win. While inflammation produces C5A, we remember that C5A is deactivated by cysteine proteases, and we've discussed this from the previous slide. And this prevents the host from establishing a good enough defense. Corticosteroid therapy and other immunosuppressive situations are known to worsen clinical outcomes, possibly because of its blunting effect on the innate immune response. But while entamoeba histolytica is known to be invasive, the muscularis interna, while positive for trophozoites, is usually not damaged. And that is why a characteristic lesion of amoebiasis is your flask-shaped ulcer. This is your flask-shaped ulcer. This is the mouth of the flask. Once interglandular epithelium falls, cells below offer poor resistance to invasion. But spread is only limited by the muscularis interna. However, it can still spread hematogenously due to the presence of capillaries within the submucosa. This study highlights the importance of specific entamoeba histolytica models, namely HGL2 for entamoeba histolytica without proper gal-galnac lectin signaling. Okay, so this is gal-galnac negative. G3 for amoeba pore expression, RBV for entamoeba histolytica lacking both amoeba pores and gal galnac, while RB8 refers to entamoeba histolytica lacking amoeba pore as well as cysteine protease. And if you take a look at these four histological slides, even if you remove the galnac, the amoeba pore, or both amoeba pore and galnac, you'd be able to see multiple trophozoites there present in the submucosa. So they are still able to penetrate through the submucosa even without a functional amoeba pore, galnac, or both. However, once they removed the cysteine proteases, the trophozoites remained on the surface. And this highlights the role of cysteine proteases particularly cysteine protease A5, in the invasive capacity of entamoeba histolytica. So cysteine proteases are the key in the invasiveness of entamoeba histolytica. And that's the whole point of this lecture. Hope you learned something. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. If you learned something, feel free to share this video. And don't stop learning.